So uh, without further ado, uh, I'm going to start by introducing myself. My name is Michele Saraiva Carillo. I am the program director at the MSc Language and Intercultural Communication at Mori House uh, School of Education and Sport here at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, here in Edinburgh is morning, so I'm going to say good morning. Uh, I'm not sure if it is afternoon or night where you are, but good afternoon and good evening uh, for the audience. Uh, we're going to start with a program overview. So you'll see that the nickname for our program is LIC or L-I-C. Um, and uh, the program is a one-year program. It's a uh, interdisciplinary degree program that aims to provide you with pedagogically grounded and practical understanding of issues surrounding studies of language, but also intercultural studies and cultural studies. So that's what we call intercultural communication. Uh, the program is based on the premise that it will help learners develop their uh, multilingual but also multicultural awareness uh, as their role as citizens of the world or cosmopolitan citizens. Also, language teachers, although this is not uh, necessarily a teaching program, many of our uh, students are or do have some background in uh, teaching, language teaching. Um, the program is designed for both pre-service and in-service language teachers. So as I said before, uh, some of our students have experiences, some of them do not, but they do have a degree in teaching. Um, it is also designed for individuals working in uh, areas related to intercultural language education policy um, and those who are interested in pursuing a PhD in you know, all those areas, some more philosophical areas, some more theoretical areas, or some more uh, practic uh, areas, such as teaching. Uh, we'll see in a minute or two some of uh, our uh, expertise areas and where our students usually get to be uh, employed. Uh, the program will introduce uh, is specialized theories, uh, especially philosophies uh, and concepts, principles that are related to intercultural studies, intercultural communication, from uh, social practice embedded in, in shifting to global processes. What that means is that our course uh, and our, our courses within the program will give you a very big range of philosophical theoretical approaches to teaching, to policy, to analyzing, and to consultancy. So that's basically what the program tries to equip students with uh, by the end of the program. That's what you're going to be qualified to do. And the program will contribute to creation of autonomous and reflective uh, thinking. This is a very uh, philosophical program, um, although there are lots of elements of practice, but the theoretical uh, underpinnings of the program are very important and uh, students are inquired and, uh, to reflect upon those philosophies based on their own context. So although some of the uh, philosophies and theories that we study are based in uh, uh, Western philosophies, we do also have non-Western philosophies, non-Eurocentric philosophies, and it's part of our decolonization of curriculum. So uh, I told you a little bit about the program itself in terms of what you expect to study. Now let's talk about the breakdown of those courses. So the program is divided into three semesters. And I know that that might sound a little bit weird because one year has two semesters. But we call it semester itself just a window of time. So the first semester, which usually uh, starts in September and it ends in December. So as you can see, it's not a six month period. Um, it's when you're going to study four core courses. Those are the compulsory courses. Three of those courses are just for LIC students, which is language and intercultural communication pedagogy, language in, uh, education for intercultural citizenship, and critical topics in intercultural communication studies. You also study sources of knowledge, understanding and analyzing research literature. But this course is not only for LIC students. This course is for everybody in the school that is um, in, enrolled 
in a master's degree course. So you have the opportunity to have classes with people outside your program, which is usually really cool because you get to know many, many people from other programs. Semester two, uh, it's when it starts in January and it, it ends in April and you must complete one core course, which is another uh, research related course that you take with students uh, across programs and two optional courses with students that are in our institute. So students that are uh, in LIC program or TESOL program or language education program. I'll let you know which courses I'm talking about. So this is just a sample of the option courses that you have uh, that you can choose to enroll uh, for semester two. So you see there are many, many courses and you get to choose two courses to take. Usually students take into consideration their own um, uh, aspirations and what they want to do with their careers, and they choose the courses accordingly. Uh, those are the, the courses that you can choose under our institute, but you can also choose courses from other institutes and other uh, programs as well, although you do need some sort of uh, permission from the program director. As I said, we are divided into three semesters. So for semester three, which goes from May to August, is when you have the preparation of your dissertation. And that is the requirement for you to get your master's degree. If you don't want to have a master's degree, if you want to have a diploma or a certificate, you do not need to write a dissertation. But if you want to have the degree of a master's degree, you do need to write a 12,000 word dissertation, and that is uh, accomplished during the semester three or from May to August of the academic year. Um, I also have a lot of support in order to be able to write this dissertation. You have dissertation lectures, there's a 60 credit uh, lecture and uh, support in terms of research. You also be uh, assigned a supervisor and the supervisor will meet with you and read your drafts and guide you through the process of writing that dissertation and it will take you to completion. The um, supervisor will only set you free once your dissertation is uh, submitted. So it is a very interesting process. The dissertation can be done in terms of uh, your individual aspirations and what the research topic that you are interested in, but it can also be part of a research project, which means that you're going to be in a group of students that are researching a similar topic and writing about different aspects within that topic, within that area. And the research groups are also um, supervised by the same supervisor. So that gets to be a uh, uh, kind of a very interesting thing to do and also an opportunity for you to network with uh, future scholars or future teachers or uh, professionals within your area of interest. As I said, uh, this is not necessarily a teaching program, but we do have lots of career opportunities in teaching. So some of the career opportunities that our students and our alumni uh, have already uh, pursued or uh, achieved is teaching language and intercultural communication in primary, secondary, and tertiary levels. We do have some students that because of the expertise being so new and so specific, they do not have a, a PhD, but they do get to teach as tutors or associate tutors in uh, higher education programs, especially undergrad programs. We had just last year a student of ours who is teaching um, in a university in London, and uh, her um, expertise is uh, Japanese language and intercultural communication. So she's an associate tutor over there for uh, undergrad students. We also have many, many students who uh, work in the primary and secondary schools uh, with teaching, but also with uh, uh, consulting, especially consulting in terms of uh, policies, institutional policies. Um, we also have some training, uh, other intercultural language teachers. So not only consulting, but being part of a team that um, develops uh, teachers and language teachers in other countries uh, and for primary, secondary and 
uh, higher education. We have students who went through designing intercultural language and curricula policies and materials, especially materials. So you work with um, publishers and publishers of textbooks and, and course books. Also undertaking empirical research. Some of our students have uh, become a um, PhD student. We just recently got some feedback from students who've been working as interns or members of the UN, um, UNESCO, but also going to PhD programs across the UK, uh, in China, in South America, and in uh, Australia and the United States. Um, also, every year we have the pleasure to accommodate representatives from large teacher recruitment agents. So they come and they uh, talk to our students um, and try to uh, promote what are the benefits of becoming an intercultural language teacher. And uh, finally, as I said, uh, some of our students pursue PhDs here at the university or in other universities across the globe. Well, I said that this was going to be a very short uh, overview of the program because I want to listen to your questions and try to answer your questions. If you have any other questions other than uh, the ones that you have today, sometimes we don't remember or we forget to ask a question that we would like to. Here's my email and also a code for you to visit the program homepage. So thank you very much. And uh, also you can ask your questions using the um, chat here on uh, our collaborate. If you raise your hand, they're going to be cute, but as uh, Aiko uh, explained before, you do not have your microphones on, so we're not going to be able to hear you. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, I have just written a message in the chat, so hopefully we will start to receive some questions. And I just wanted to, uh, while we wait for the questions to come in, um, share some information about um, fees and funding and scholarship opportunities. So I will um, include a link in the chat just now, um, but you can find information about our um, fees and funding on our, our school website. Uh, the school offers just a very small number of scholarship opportunities. Uh, one is called the Murray House Access Scholarship, and this is for um, a UK resident. Um, and one is called the Murray House Country Scholarships. And this is a scholarship. There are five scholarships available um, for this, but they are from uh, students from particular countries. So please have a look at that. There's also um, a scholarship called GREAT Scholarship, Great Scholarship, and that is um, available for students who are coming from Mexico. So please have a look if um, you might find a scholarship that you're eligible for, and please do, I would encourage you to apply for these. Just to pick on, um, pick up what Aiko said about funding, uh, her last message was, we would always encourage students to seek our funding, out funding for themselves. Um, you do have the chance to pursue some funding uh, related to your government or your country. We have lots of students who have government related or institutional related funding. Uh, based on their undergrad students' uh, uh, studies and also the, the country of residency or citizenship. Uh, myself, when I was a student at Murray House, I had a funding from my own country. Uh, and sometimes the timeline can be a little complicated, but if you have the, the, the support of your country, you can always get in touch with us. And we do have a team to support you understand the timeline and, and what you need to apply and submit in terms of documentation uh, based on the criteria or where your funding is going to be able to cover. Uh, thank you for your question, Masaya. I, I'm, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing your name correctly and I apologize. Um, thank you for this opportunity. I have a question about after career any international students working for business companies in the UK after graduation. Uh, 
We do have students who work as consultants, especially for uh, social media companies or uh, for the social media platforms for some companies. I wouldn't know uh, specifically the area or what kind of business. But some of our students who work um, with social media is specifically about intercultural communication and intercultural awareness um, and how they can promote certain companies and certain products in a way that it is more uh, inclusive using uh, language and the right sort of approach. So, yeah, we do have students who work for that. We have one student specifically that comes to my that works for a fashion industry um, and uh, it is a um, a person who makes uh, uh, the TikTok for that uh, company. The person is not a TikToker, but the person is behind the scenes uh, dealing with all the language and scripts and everything that the TikTokers for the company um, promote and produce. So yeah, there's a lot of different um, um, careers that sometimes we, as part of the program, don't even think about. But when we bring those people who uh, are business people or people in teaching, people in consultancy and policy and government, they um, tell us what they need in our students uh, when they fit the profile. They get to go to those um, very exciting careers that uh, boring academics as myself would never even dream about it. So yeah, I hope this answers your question. That sounds exciting. Maybe we need to look into TikTok, don't we? <laughs> That's the future. Yes. Um, I was going to add as well, um, there's some information on our um, school website about career opportunities uh, related to this program, but I wanted to um, signpost the university has an amazing uh, career services department and uh, students have access to the career services department as, as soon as they um, start their studies with us and uh, the career service can help you with things like interview preparation, uh, CV preparation, preparing your resume, and um, also I think they have a, a careers hub website which gives you some ideas for opportunities where you can at least start networking professionally whilst you're a student. And then also you still have access to the career services support for two years after graduation. So again, whilst you once you've graduated and whilst you're um, thinking about your applications, you can still get in touch and make use of their their support. So I'll, I'll again add a link into the chat, but you you kind of won't be left unsupported um, once you've graduated. You're still able to make use of the university services. Yeah, that's a very good point. Another thing that uh, we try to provide as a program, um, every week during the entire program, you have what we call class meetings or program tutorials, which is an hour session with our academic cohort lead, which is a, a, a member of the academic uh, staff who leads um, those sessions based on students' needs for the program, but also in terms of careers. So just to give some examples, uh, the cohort lead this uh, year has uh, prepared sessions during which students come with questions based on how to build curriculum for um, specific job applications, how to apply for jobs that are within academia, outside academia, um, and how to work on their resume. There's also lots of volunteering opportunities in Edinburgh. I think it was last week, Keiko, if I'm not mistaken, that we had um, a, a volunteer fair. So students could go to the fair and see uh, which businesses around town were looking for volunteers. And it's always a, a good uh, uh, practice, but also an environment that you can network a lot in. And maybe, who knows, try to. Um, turn your volunteering job into a paying job, yeah. Let me see. Um, so Bobek has a question. Uh, thank you for your question. So don't, the background for this program, can you still apply for uh, the master's level? Well, we have students with uh, uh, lots of different backgrounds and uh, undergrad uh, studies. 
So uh, it's not only languages. We do have students that come from um, communication, journalism, um, that are students who sometimes come from hospitality areas uh, that depending on their um, uh, studies, we, we can definitely check on a, on a, on a person by person basis and, and make a decision uh, regarding their application. So I would say yes, apply because we do receive applications from many different areas other than uh, teaching and language. And the admission team, they always uh, send us those applications that are not um, specifically in, within the area, but because of the student's background or interests, uh, we definitely have uh, the chance to go through the application and make a decision as a team. Yeah, that's definitely important what I just said, that you can speak about your relevant experience in the personal statement. The first thing that we check uh, as a, uh, the staff team and not the admissions team, obviously the admissions team checks uh, uh, all the uh, uh, documentation, but the first thing that we check is the personal statement and then we go through the, the CV and all the other documents. The personal statement for us is something really important because that is what, um, set the students apart and that's how we get to know a little bit about the applicants uh, as a person and what their aspirations are so yeah i would definitely encourage to apply uh the worst thing that can happen is uh, your application to be denied or you get a message saying maybe if you have those other documentations to provide it would be a strong application so yes definitely thank you for your question bobby yeah, I'm loving the questions. I hope you guys have some more and you can uh, please feel free to type them into the chat. It's um, a great prompt. Oh, that's good timing. Another one. Yeah. Uh, let's know about the proportion of international students and British students as course. Uh, no, don't apologize for asking again. Ask away. Um, we do have a, uh, a very big cohort of, of students coming from China um, and then we do have students coming from all around the world so in, uh, I think this year this academic year specific and usually we have a hundred students for uh, this program per year um, and uh, we do have students from Scotland from England um, I don't think we have any Welsh or Irish this year no we don't we have uh, a a uh, part time, so it's a it's a student who's taking a two year program. I should have mentioned that as well. If you are not able to study within the full time program, you can always apply for a part time program, which takes you from one up to four six years, depending on how much you can dedicate, how long, how much time you can dedicate to the program. So we do have uh, students that are part time. Um, and they are from other countries within Britain. Um, we do also have students from um, Saudi Arabia, Korea, Japan, um, South America. We have students from oh, we have a student from Paraguay. We have students from Texas, United States. Um, we do not have any students from Brazil this year. I am Brazilian, that's why I'm I'm, I'm saying it. Uh, but um, we the Paraguayan student is almost my neighbor so they speak portuguese and we can speak portuguese and spanish uh, sometimes but yeah it's a very it's an international for sure uh, cohort and and people come from all around this year already when i look into the applications uh, that we already got we got applications from 30 different countries so it's um it's a very uh good uh, uh cohort and very diverse also when we speak about uh, the diversity within the, the cohort, usually people get to the point say, oh, it's um, mostly people from this country or mostly people who um, identify as that gender. But diversity is so much more than nationality and gender. You will find that although um, 
people might seem that they are the same because they come from the same place or because they are from a certain gender, they're so different culturally. And, and you can learn so much about other people's cultures, uh, regardless where they come from um, and who they are. Uh, the Institute as well, across the three programs that we have, have many, many events that are um, with the three programs or with the entire school. And you will see that other programs that are more related to teaching within the UK, the students uh, are more, obviously, they are Scottish and they are British, and they uh, participate in our events because they do feel they miss the opportunity to know people for, from all around the world in, in their programs. So yeah, it's a very, it's a very large community. It's not a couple of students. We're talking about hundreds uh, of students. Um, who try to celebrate their diversity in many, many different ways. And I was thinking too um, about the universities, societies and uh, other opportunities for uh, our international students to meet Scottish, real Scottish students. Um, there tend to be quite a lot of inter international students at postgraduate level, but a lot of um, local students at undergraduate level. So if you join a society, you probably will, or like the gym even at the university, you might have more of an opportunity to meet and, uh, I don't know, chat in English, I guess. Well, you chat in English during class, I'm sure, but uh, uh, meet with uh, yeah, other local it people in societies. Yeah, it's a very good point. And uh, speaking about the gym, like we are the school of education and sport, so we have lots of people uh, who whose programs are related to sport. And just across uh, the street from uh, the building where most uh, classes for like take place, we have the swimming pool and the gym, and and uh, occasionally we have some Olympians, right, uh, that we can see over there. Um, so yeah, it's a great it's a great community, uh, and um, Echo has uh, uh, hit the the nail in the head. Like for example, I only teach for uh, those three uh, PGT programs. So obviously, I I my my students are mostly uh, from international uh, uh, background. They are not uh, British, but just uh, to compare. My husband also teaches uh, in the School of Education, and his program is an undergrad program in primary education. So all his students are Scottish, and that's the the kind of difference that we see within the programs. But the the social events and um, the communities that we have, and uh, uh, everything that you can participate as a student, will give you the opportunity to uh, meet people from you know around the world and and with all sorts of stories and backgrounds. Also the staff, I should say, the um, uh, teaching staff and the services staff, it's very diverse in terms of everything that you can imagine like, culturally. We have people from all sorts of backgrounds, countries, languages, cultures, uh, religions, gender. So yeah, it's a, it's a very welcoming and diverse um, institution for sure. Yes. Yeah, the Olympians walk amongst us. And it's funny because sometimes my students want to, they want to take pictures with the Olympians and they want to ask about medals and they feel like, oh, I don't want to bother. They love when you do that. <laughs> they really appreciate to be recognized by their achievements because it's not every day that you can have Olympians uh, walking amongst them. Let me check, there's another question. I have just um, read the question and it was about um, scholarships and funding. So um, yes, I did include the link and I will add it again uh, with the details about the scholarships. The school scholarships, you're right, are not um, full fee scholarships. And indeed it's very, very rare. Um, and I don't think that this university offers any full fee scholarships for postgraduate study that I'm aware of. Um, it's very, very rare to find a scholarship that pays full fees. Um, 
So as we, as I said before, we would definitely encourage you to look far and wide for funding opportunities. And I think you would be able to have more than one of our, like our school scholarship and another scholarship. But the idea is that if you were to receive a scholarship for full fees from somewhere else, for example, like I think the Achievening Scholarship would cover full fees. If you were to get that, then we would ask that you would um, not no longer accept your school scholarship um, so that you're you know, not taking on more than 100% of fees in, in money. But uh, yeah, I, I, as I say, the, our school ones don't, don't cover full fees and we would encourage you to look for funding as far and wide as you can. And as Michelle mentioned, look for anywhere you can in your local government or with your employer, if you have one, um, any, any different opportunities for you to um, take up funding would be encouraged. Yeah, try to find uh, those that are very specific and they might apply uh, to less people. Uh, as I said before, the one, the scholarship that I got was very specific for, um, it was um, uh, provided by the Brazilian government. You had to be Brazilian. You had to be uh, uh, within a certain age group. Um, the courses that you trying to, the programs that were trying to enroll needed to be certain uh, areas. So the, the more specific the, the scholarship is or the funding is, uh, less people will be competing with. So that is a, a good uh, thing for you to be uh, uh, mindful about. Just go and check those uh, scholarships that are not uh, as popular and uh, that you have less competition. Um, and be sure that obviously you are legible that you are, uh, are within the criteria that they're asking. And I think we've got all the questions so far, and we definitely have time for more questions. And I noticed that um, someone has someone new has joined the chat. So I just wanted to say that um, we are recording this session and uh, the recording will be sent to all registrants of the session afterwards, so you can catch up on anything that you will have missed. And we are now welcoming any questions that we have about language and intercultural communication in the text chat just now, and we will respond to these. So please feel free to ask any questions that you have in the chat just now. And while we wait, I will also include one link to um, the university's admissions team, well, our college's admissions team, they actually have a, a live chat. Um, so if you have any like quick questions about your application or about whether your background is relevant to this program or what sort of documentation you might need, they're really quick to respond in their using their live chat. Um, so please, and they're really nice and obviously it doesn't have any um, impact on your application. It's kind of a separate system. So please feel free to make use of that. And uh, hopefully that will make it nice and easy for you to feel confident to start your application with us. So you do have a question about um, application in the chat. Um, hi, so I, I think it's uh, Shakofa. Um, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Uh, so you are from Afghanistan, you live in Italy, and you want to apply uh, for admission in university. Uh, no, you do not need to be in England. Uh, the application system, it's all online. And uh, as I was saying, if you have any questions, it's very, um, user friendly so the step by step it's really uh, uh it's complex and intense but it's not difficult to follow but if you find it difficult to follow and uh, uh you need some support you can always uh, ask on the chat and and try to get some uh one to help you
yes, if that was the question that during the program you need to be here in Edinburgh, then yes, the, the, the program itself is a in-person program, but for, for your application, uh, you do not need to be uh, here. Uh, once you get an offer and you uh, accept that offer, you get to, to the timeline and when is your uh, time of arrival. We usually have our induction week, uh, the second week of uh, September, and classes start on the third week of September. But many, many students get here way before so they can figure out uh, accommodation. And also some students get the uh, summer course for in English so they can have some more support in terms of language and, and those courses start uh, first, second week of August. So yeah, we have students who arrive here way like a month before the, the program actually starts. Uh, you just completed your undergrad degree and the semester's results haven't been released. Yeah, we do have some cases like that and there are some documentation that, that are what we call um, uh, unofficial documentation that you can get from your university and our university will accept that until you are uh, uh, able to provide the documentation needed for your degree. Exactly. What happens usually is that if you don't have the documentation that we need, you get a conditional offer and then it becomes unconditional once you provide us with those documents. Uh, does the professor instruct and check? Yes. Um, so for the dissertation period, I'm going to give you an example that it, it, re uh, it's, it reflects my experience as a supervisor. So what I do is that I have uh, uh, meetings with my supervisees every two weeks. And during those two weeks, they have chances to um, apply what we discuss during the meetings in their drafts. The drafts are read throughout. And the last thing that is submitted before the final submission is a full draft. So what my supervisees do is that they have to submit to me a full draft of the entire dissertation and I read it throughout and provide feedback and comments so they can um, apply those comments uh, accordingly before they submit their final draft, which is the final document. Before the final, the first final draft, we have a, a chapter by chapter, section by section uh, for them to um, write slowly but with the amount of feedback that they feel comfortable. Also, we have discussions regarding uh, literature review, uh, criticality, philosophical framework, uh, analytical framework, methodology, data collection, data analysis. So yeah, it's a very comprehensive uh, process and uh, the supervisor will be uh, guiding the student through all the way. Lots of meetings, lots of coffee and tea, and, and sometimes occasionally tears. Not very common though, but sometimes it happens because it can be very intense. You're welcome, yeah. It's very exciting though. I, I should say students, uh, sometimes they get here in September, they already start talking about their dissertation because that's how exciting it is to be able to um, finalize your studies with a piece of work that reflects your studies, your interests, and also your research. But um, it is for sure the, the favorite part of the program is the dissertation period for all students. The feedback that we get is always the same. We love the classes, we love the lectures, we love the workshops, but the dissertation period and, and being able to be in a one-on-one -on -one with a supervisor is their favorite part.
I've just typed an encouraging note in the chat, so hopefully we will get some more questions. But I just wanted to take this um, chance to show, I think it's on the last slide. Um, there are a couple of uh, additional resources that might be useful to you, and I'll type these links into the chat in just a moment. Um, but the first one is a virtual visit. Um, this is an online uh, resource. So, the, and there are some kind of 360 uh, visual representations of the campus. So I know it's really hard sometimes when, if you live abroad, to um, actually come to Edinburgh in advance of your studies and see what the campus is like. But this will hopefully give you a bit of a flavor of um, our beautiful quad and what a typical uh, lecture hall looks like on our campus. Um, and also there, the other link is to the Enbra student chat. It's kind of sometimes called Unibuddy and you have the ability to select a student from Mori House to speak to. Um, I'm not sure if there's one from uh, Lick, but you can definitely find some postgraduate students from Mori House who can tell you about their experience and you can just kind of chat informally with them and ask them all of your burning questions for a real student who are going to give you the real truth about what their experience is like. So um, I'll link to those and you can please make use of them in your in your own time. Yeah, and one of the things that we have here uh, for our program is that in the first two weeks of the program, students select their representatives. So we do have students reps that participate in meetings with the staff. They provide those feedback for the program, and they also do those things of helping um, students who are trying to uh, understand how the program works and uh, stuff like that. I know that one of our reps is uh, preparing um, sort of uh, short videos across campus and uh, we have been encouraged them uh, to do so. So as soon as we have uh, those videos with their permission, of course, uh, we should uh, um, add them to our page. Uh, I know that it's a personal project for this specific rep um, uh, for their social media, but we are very interested in, in seeing that if we can add to our uh, program page and people could just visit and see uh, the places where the classes take place and, and stuff like that, the students' events. Uh, Bobic asked about how long it takes to receive your CAS, which is, I think, a number you need in order to apply for visas to study. And I'm, I'm afraid I don't have that detailed information myself, but I would suggest you um, contact the admissions team and they will be able to let you know when they kind of allocate those CAS numbers. And also, I'm going to share a link in the chat to the university's um, visa and immigrations team. They're very, very helpful. I don't think they have a live chat, but they do have their email address um, listed there. And you can also get in touch with them uh, to ask any questions about things like applying for visas, and they'll be able to support you with that. So I'll, I'll find those links and add them to the chat just now. Yeah, this is a very good question because we know how uh, different it is from country to country, uh, the timeline for once you apply for the visa until you get to a point that you have to go somewhere, either to an office or the embassy itself um, to get your interview or to um, provide your documentation. So yeah, good question. Um, I know that it is not long uh, because as I said, I went through the process as a student long time ago. But um, yeah, it's definitely something to keep in mind uh, for my, I know that some of our students get uh, their visa process uh, within two weeks, maybe less, maybe a little bit more, but some other students, depending on uh, the country of domicile, can take up, uh, up to a month. I know that my country, for example, can take up to a month because you just, it, you need to be in the embassy and the, the time slots for that are not so many yes good point that's why we we always recommend to apply as soon as possible so you do have a lot of time uh to deal with stuff such as funding and visa and accommodation and all the things that i need to prepare before i get here so yeah the sooner the better super i think um 
I have one reply that says that all the questions have been answered. So I, I'm not sure if uh, there are any other questions, but if if you if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat. And um, maybe we will wrap up a couple of minutes early, Michelle, if you're OK with that. Yeah, no problem. The questions have all been answered. You also have our communication channels. Feel free to send me a line uh, if you have any questions about the program, if you have any questions about campus, Edinburgh, how cold and or hot it is, because it's supposed to be winter, right? But I don't think it is. Uh, it's, so it's, it's not too hot. bad. Yeah, I agree with yeah. that. <laughs> It's not as bad as this it should be by this point. So yeah, just send us a line and um, you'll be happy to answer the questions uh, as quickly as possible.